Climate change is dead last. Okay, and people are want education, fresh water, peace, security, food, food. Yeah, exactly. So while the UN says it's the most pressing issue on the planet, their own poll says it's the lowest issue of the all of the 13 or so items they listed. I'm here in Madrid, Spain, of course, covering the United Nations Climate Change Conference. And because we're not allowed inside the conference, I sort of have to find the news on the outside. And I ran into a fellow Canadian denier, <laughs> Tom Harris, who has recently given a speech at an event hosted by the Heartland Institute. That's right. Yeah. Which I think is great. You guys held sort of like an anti UN yeah. climate change a, conference. A, a counter conference, a conference of realists. And, you know, if you can check it out on the web at climaterealityforum.com and you can see the presentations. And perhaps the most interesting was a 19 year old, Naomi Saib, who actually explained how she moved from being a climate alarmist to being a climate realist. And William Happer, a PhD pro uh, professor emeritus from Princeton University, one of Trump's top science advisors, also spoke and he talked about the fact that carbon dioxide is not dangerous. I mean, it's plant food. So it was an interesting event. I, I spoke about uh, the dangers and problems of renewable energy and in particular wind and solar power. I mean everybody talks about these as if they're somehow holy, you know, but in fact if you actually look at them closely, wind turbines in Spain, according to the Spanish Ornithological Society, there's 18,000 of these huge turbines and they're killing um, between 200, about 200 birds per turbine per year and 400 bats per turbine per year. So if you do the math, they say it works out to somewhere and they're, you know, it's very approximate because they haven't analyzed the whole country, but six to 18, I believe it is, million birds and bats are killed every year. Just in Spain. Just in Spain. And you know, it, it is pretty tragic because there's twice as many bats being killed than birds. And the reason is a bird has to be hit by the blades. And these huge turbines, I mean, the tip speed is something like 400 miles an hour. I mean, they're really going. Birds can't get out of the way. But a bat, if they even fly behind the blade in the low pressure zone, what they find is that their lungs burst because they're very thin. And so they have twice as many bats being killed as birds in Spain. Now, you know, these, these bats are actually being driven to extinction. So if you're a real conservationist, you should hate wind turbines. It's interesting because the presentation at Carleton University just a few months ago from Dr. Elizabeth Anderson was looking at the real costs, the environmental costs of wind and solar power. And it was pretty obvious that the huge amount of toxic waste that's produced in China when you, for example, mine the rare earths that go into the super magnets on the, uh, on the top of the wind turbines, that, that that's, it makes them among the most polluting energy sources on the planet. China is now the world's leader in solar power production. You know, the actual making of these things that they sell all over the world. And the toxic waste is just incredible. So the whole idea that, you know, we're having um, benign, environmentally friendly wind and solar is crazy. And that doesn't even look at the, the, the realism of actually generating power. Because, you know, the... Um, Independent uh, Ontario was it Electrical Board. It's the Capital uh, Crown Corporation that does the forecast for the next 18 months. They actually forecast what the capacity factor would be for wind and solar power. In other words, if you have a five megawatt wind turbine, what fraction of that are you getting on average at peak power when we need it the most? And it's quite funny to see the graphs. In fact, I presented it in the Heartland Conference. They forecast for the next 18 months that the most that we're going to get out of wind power is something in the neighborhood of 37% of their capacity, and that would be in the winter, and it drops down to something like 13%. I can't remember exactly in the summer. Solar, though, is the exact opposite. You get most of your solar power in the summer. Still, it's only around 13% of its supposed capacity, and in the winter, it's zero. And <laughs> that's what they forecast, okay? And this is the government crown corporation. And, uh, of course... And yet they still invest in it. 
Yeah, well, happily, Ford is backing off okay. in Ontario. Yeah. yeah, he's backing off, and I think that's very smart. But, but think about it. You have field, fields full of, full of solar panels covered with snow. I mean, how much power are you going to get? <laughs> for, well, well for and, <laughs> and there's no daylight in the winter yeah, in, exactly. in Canada, in vast tracts. Yeah, and in fact, it's interesting. Uh, Steve Gorham, who's the head of the Climate Science Coalition of America, who we work with quite often, he took a study that was done uh, looking at how much energy do you get out of solar power in Germany and Switzerland in comparison with how much they actually, uh, you know, how much energy does it take to make them and to maintain them and eventually dispose of them. And the conclusion from that study was that they actually use more energy than they ever produce in their entire lifetime. So he took that information and he projected it over to Canada at, or actually North America at the same latitude, and you realize that Canada falls above that line. So Canada for wind and solar power, or solar power I should say, is what they call N-O-N-E, which is negative on net energy. In other words, if you put up solar power in Canada, well, it's fine if you're off the grid and you sure. need power and you're prepared to pay 10 times what it normally costs, but you never get back uh, the energy that it takes to make them, maintain them, and dispose of them. So Canada is a, is a net none for solar power. And so, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. I'll give you another really interesting example. Take the California Solar Ranch, I believe it's what it's called. It's just 100 miles north, uh, northwest of Los Angeles. And it is about 100 times bigger than a mid-sized gas plant and it produces one-tenth the output. <laughs> and it's toxic. Yeah, that's right. They, what are they gonna do with all the, all the waste? I mean, right now, the Chinese manufacturers are just throwing it into the river, into the atmosphere, they don't care, because it allows them to make them very cheap. But indeed, they're highly, uh, highly um, destructive to the environment. You know, the other thing, so, so it's basically is four things. Destructive to the environment, very intermittent, okay? The capacity factor is very low. To give you an example, nuclear is nearly 100%. It gives almost all the power it's supposed to. I mean, there's some time periods when they're down but for maintenance, or at least reduced, but nothing like wind and solar, you know? And natural gas, coal, oil, those are all, you know, pretty solid, dependable, high capacity factor energy sources. Um, the other thing is, they're you know, wind and solar are diffuse massive area. The London Array okay, is the largest offshore wind turbine uh, farm in the world and I don't like the word farm because it sounds sort of benign. And it, and it uh, indicates that they're actually producing something a lot of the time. <laughs> well this wind farm is a hundred square kilometers. A hundred square kilometers and I can't remember the exact output. I think it's 233 megawatts. But you know you have coal stations and nuclear stations that are thousands of megawatts. You know so I mean you gotta have the hundred <laughs> Square and the interesting thing is they're finding that whales are affected in the local vicinity because their sonar gets all confused, you know, and they're saying it can lead them to actually beach and die. Now, this is something I don't know a great deal about. I think it's fairly new research, but University of St. What is it, St. Andrews in Scotland was where they were doing that research, saying that, in fact, the, um, the problem to whales could be very, very significant. You think about it, 100 square kilometers of 60-story wind turbines? You know, it's going to generate a lot of the low-frequency sound, the infrasound, that really hurts people that live near these. And, uh, you know, a friend of mine, Shelley Correa, you might know her, mm -hmm. uh, she lives in West Lincoln, Ontario, where they, they wouldn't... Kathleen Wynne said they wouldn't put up a turbine near her property because she had a child that was needing medical attention. And um, they put up a 62-story turbine, 600-plus feet, uh, 500 meters from her house. Okay. Now, those things produce infrasound, low-frequency sound that goes right through the wall and can drive you crazy. And if nothing else, your property value goes down yeah. low. So you got their intermittent, their diffuse, uh, they're environmentally damaging, and, oh, the last one, expensive. NRCAN has on their website a plot showing that the average cost of onshore wind and, and coal and nuclear and hydro are all about the same. But what they don't tell you is that not included in that, it's called levelized cost of electricity, what's not included is the requirement for backup power when the wind's not blowing. <laughs> You know, and it's interesting because one of the top leaders in the Scottish power industry, uh, Rupert Steele, I believe his name was, he said that for uh, two gigawatts, I believe it was, of wind power, you need about one and a half gigawatts of backup. <laughs> so, indeed, 
what you have then is that has to be added, you know, billion dollar backup gas plants. In fact, Robert Kennedy Jr., you know, an mm -hmm. environmental lawyer, he says that when you're building wind power, you're really building natural gas stations. I mean, you have to because you've got to have something to fill in the gap. And um, so when you factor that in and you also factor in the, the subsidies because billions in subsidies, Believe it or not, um, Climate Realism Canada, which is a new group uh, that, that has been just started, uh, Robert Lyman spoke in both Montreal and Toronto. He's an energy economist. He's great. He works a lot with uh, Friends of Science. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And he wrote a paper trying to analyze how much are the subsidies really costing for wind and solar power. And, I mean, it is literally billions of dollars, but it's all at different levels of government. It's federal, provincial, municipal. And so his final conclusion in the paper, and people should go to friendsofscience.org, it's, it's very good. Robert Lyman, if you do a search, you'll see this paper. Uh, he specifically says, no one has totaled it up. So we don't actually know <laughs> what the total cost is of the uh, subsidies. So when you add on all those factors, massive cost, you know, and uh, all the other things, it's just dumb to go to wind and solar, and it's not environmentally friendly anyways. I would add maybe a fifth thing to your list, and that is human rights. Yeah. Human rights abuses. I mean, there's a great human cost mm -hmm. to producing renewables, mm -hmm. especially in cobalt mines. A lot of that is slave child labor, yeah. um, where entire communities are ruined. And I'm told the environmentalists care about social justice. And I think that's one of the leading social justice issues of our time is how the environmental movement is off putting or outsourcing mm -hmm. the environmental and social cost of their green crusade here yeah. on developing countries. Yeah. Well, in fact, you know, one of the weirdest things is that the left say that they are champions of social justice, oh, and, yet they, and yet they <laughs> promote energy sources that impoverish the poor, okay, more than anyone. I mean, a rich person doesn't care. It's such a small fraction of their total income. And then they promote things that that kill, in the case of the Altamont Pass in California, since it started, they estimate 3,000 golden eagles have been killed. So they're supporting the climate scare, which sabotages the kind of causes that they say they hold dear. And I think the solution is for environmentalists to completely kick the climate alarmists off the stage. Say, get lost. We have real issues to focus on. You know, we have real land, water, and air pollution. Those are things that we should work on. Um, and we have real human rights issues and real conservation issues. Go away, climate real or climate activists. What you're doing is you're sabotaging all these other causes. Real things. Yeah, real things. I mean, I think it's absurd that I live in Ottawa and they're debating climate change in the year 2050 in the House of Commons beside a river that is too polluted to swim in most of the time. Like, like, duh, why don't they clean up the river? You know, we used to take our children to Britannia Beach, just up, up river, and we had to wash the toys that they played with in the water with all kinds of Javex and things because it smelled like a sewer. And that's going right by the House of Commons while they debate climate change in the year 2050. Like, it, come on, wake up, focus on real things. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the conference, the UN Climate Change Conference. The UN has hyped this conference. You mm -hmm. said you sort of get sick of it. I'm sort of glad they didn't allow me inside because yeah. um, I don't feel like being managed the way the other <laughs> journalists are. And uh, there's a lot of hypocrisy to see outside. But the UN is very excited about this conference. They say mm -hmm. it's much bigger than Poland. Oh, there's yeah. so many more journalists interested. I think it's bigger than Poland because Poland didn't actually care. Poland was happy to take the money. Yeah from the UN, and then they put it on top of the uh, coal capital of the region. Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, that's right. I mean, coal is a very important energy source for Poland. And uh, I think Madrid is just kind of thrilled to get it because it was a last minute thing. You know, Chile suddenly couldn't do it or they didn't want to do it. They thought it would be pretty bad PR, you know, when one of the things driving the high prices was the stupid climate policies. But, um, yeah, the Spanish people are, are wonderful, you know, like I've really enjoyed interacting with them. But these climate people, I don't know, they're, they're kind of like, I don't know if they're dense or, <laughs> or what they are, because, you know... They're just true believers. It's like a religion. I, I think so, yeah. And, and when I was in Copenhagen, it was interesting. The Al Gore effect hit hard. 
because it was the coldest winter they'd had in ages. That's the Al Gore effect. Wherever he goes, it gets cold. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's stopping global warming. And, you know, the Bella Center didn't plan the conference properly. There was 30,000 people that were registered to attend, and they could only hold 15,000. So they estimated that a lot wouldn't come. Well, in fact, just to make a, a long story short, uh, most of them did. And so you had Africans who'd come. They'd paid a king's ransom to come to Copenhagen, and they were standing in lineups, you know, at zero degrees. They didn't have parkas or anything. It was miserable. I suspect that one of the reasons there were a lot of protests on the street was those might have been UN delegates that couldn't get in. <laughs> Just something to do. Yeah. Uh, Tom, I want to give you a chance to uh, tell us about your new projects yeah. that you're working on. Um, Climate Realism Canada. Yeah, Climate Realism Canada. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because um, outside of Friends of Science, there's not a lot of people doing this work. And Friends yeah. of Science seems to be pretty Western-based, and I think you are taking a national That's approach. Right. Well, our group, International Climate Science Coalition, we focus on the world. And it's actually really tough to get published in Canada. And as, just as an aside, it's interesting that when I started writing in this field in 1999 with Dr. Tim Patterson, wife of uh, Liz Anderson, actually, or husband of Liz Anderson, mm -hmm. who gave that talk on uh, the, the environmental costs, um, we would get published in The Citizen, The Vancouver Sun, The Winnipeg Free Press. We got all across the country. Mm -hmm. And gradually the doors have closed. Until now, with the exception of you and Canada Free Press and a, some small outlets here and there occasionally uh, the bigger ones but almost never will they cover us and I asked the editor of a leading Canadian newspaper I won't say who he is because he told me confidentially I said uh, why won't you show both sides of the issue and let the readers decide which they agree with and he said we agree with David Suzuki and I said yeah but do you have anybody on staff who has even a Bachelor of Science to decide anything about the science he said no I said well Come on, why do you not cover both sides? He said, our advertisers wouldn't like it. Because, of course, if you have on one page a Prius or some other vehicle or some kind of product in which they're reducing greenhouse gases, okay, and the other page you say it doesn't make any difference, that doesn't sort of wash too well with advertisers. The other thing, of course, is that... Um, Hang on, it's, fun it's funny though <laughs> that, sorry to interrupt you, but it is very funny to hear somebody say our advertisers wouldn't like it mm -hmm. when their readership is going down. Their yeah. consumers want to hear maybe two sides of the story. Well, that's right, that's right. And that's why this Naomi Sipes that spoke at the conference is, is so refreshing because she did what we're hoping many people will do through our new group called Climate Realism Canada. Okay, and it, it has a French name, which I can't remember right off the top of my head. But regardless, it's going to be in Quebec too. We held seminars in both Montreal at the Mount Royal Club and also in Toronto at the Shangri-La Hotel. Gorgeous place. And uh, we brought in people like Bob Lyman and uh, Jay Lear and James Taylor, both, you know, originally Jay was with Heartland, now he's with us. And uh, Patrick Moore, oh, he was awesome. We love him. Patrick Moore was amazing. He showed, believe it or not, that CO2 has been dropping steadily for millions of years. And as a consequence, if humans hadn't come along and started to liberate CO2 into the atmosphere, we would get to the point of the death of plants. And that would be the end of life on Earth. And so Patrick told both the Montreal and the Toronto uh, seminars for the Climate Realism Canada that human humanity has saved life on Earth. And this is an ex-leader of the Greenpeace, you know. So this group is, you know, we're just growing. We're fairly new. Bob Lyman is, is a major player, as you've interviewed him before. Uh, and you're going to hear more from us, you know, because the, the public really, I find, are thirsty to hear some alternative point of view, especially when the price starts to hit home. Okay, I mean, Ontario, electricity rates since uh, 2002 have gone up more than 200%. I mean, it varies up and down, but in that neighborhood. Uh, and that, of course, is a social justice issue. And that's where the left, I think, are being taken for a ride, you know. So I'm glad you, you stand up for the good guys. <laughs> Well, I'd like to think that I'm a consumer advocate, yeah. it, and, and that's one of the reasons that I am firmly against carbon taxes, because as you rightly point out, those are the sorts of things that hurt the poor the most, mm -hmm. and they don't really do anything. It just lines the pockets of government, yeah. and the rich who promote these ideas can certainly afford the bump in the price of gas mm -hmm. and milk, but the poor cannot. Well, yeah, and, and one thing you know that really upset the Africans when I was in Copenhagen is that 
the UN wanted half of their roughly a billion dollars US a day that's going into climate finance. I think we spoke about this yeah. before. Uh, they want half of it to go to adaptation, helping people adapt to climate change. But 18 times more money than adaptation is going into trying to stop climate change. So in a way, that's saying to the Africans, you're not so important because we're not going to help you, but we're going to work on trying to stop climate change in the year 2060. Like, no, come on, wake up. Climate change is natural. It occurs all the time. <clears throat> People need help adapting to natural climate change. The amount we're causing is unknown and probably very small. But regardless, spending all your money on what might happen someday according to computer models that don't work, like that's just ridiculous. And as a social justice issue, letting people suffer today because of some theoretical thing that might someday happen, Man, we got to tell people about this, you know, because it's huge. I mean, it was going to become the world's largest industry. Uh, it, it was even going to pass armaments, but happily it slowed down. <laughs> but it's still well over a billion a day. I mean, the last two years where the Climate um, Policy Initiative did their analysis, <clears throat> it was over a half a trillion a year that they were able to track. And there's probably much, much more. So think what the world could do with a half a trillion a year. And the UN poll, My World, is the poll they have. And you can go to the UN website and search for My World, and you can, run, you can actually take part in the poll. And they listed various things that they asked the public, what should we focus on? And they listed climate change right at the beginning because, of course, they want people to say that. Well, guess what? The po after about 9 million votes around the world, much of it in places like Nigeria, climate change is dead last. Okay? And people are want education, fresh water, peace, security. Food. Food. Yeah, exactly. So while the UN says it's the most pressing issue on the planet, their own poll says it's the lowest issue of the, all of the 13 or so items they listed. And I, I think that's, that's hilarious, partly. But it's also ironic that a UN poll would, con would completely conflict with the UN's message. <laughs> You know, I, I think some of that is uh, being reflected in the UN's messaging this year. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that they're not saying it's climate change? They're, they've changed it from it's not climate change, it's an emergency. Right. So they're trying to appropriately fear monger into people mm -hmm. caring about something. They very clearly don't. Well, and it's really interesting. On the bus today, I was talking to a woman who was a specialist in communication about the fact that the environmental groups are now purposely exaggerating, and they even have discussions on the web about this, where they feel that to grab the headlines and to generate action, they have to purposely exaggerate, even beyond their own exaggerated forecasts. And there are a fair number of scientists who are now on that side who are saying, oh, come on, this is remember the boy who cried wolf. I mean, if they say it's going to be the end of the world if we don't do X in 12 years, a lot of people are going to still be alive in 12 years. They're going to say, okay, well, like, what's happened? So their forecasts won't be believed. So even if a person does agree with the UN, this new approach of really generating exciting and crazy, really, conclusions, it's going to backfire and it's going to help our group actually because I think more and more Canadians are going to say come on let's have the conservatives push uh, uh, you know climate realism and sadly as you know in the last election they didn't they were actually supporting the scare although they had a different solution they were going to use regulations instead of tax well they're both wrong <laughs> we should focus on real air land and water pollution and forget about this climate thing um, because it's just going to cost us a fortune and do nothing well, Tom, I want to thank you so much for your time. I'm very excited to see your new group get off the ground and uh, offer that other side of the story, something we think is a journalistic mission here at The Rebel. And, uh, you know, we shouldn't have to wait to come to Madrid to talk to you. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and as our group gets going, I'll tell you more about it. And I'll set up interviews with other people in the group because I think it's going to make a difference. I hope so. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> thank you. I'm here in Madrid, Spain with my colleague Kian Bexi covering the UN Global Warming Conference. To see all of our reports from here on the ground, go to rebelun.com. And to support our independent journalism and our accountability journalism that really isn't being done by anybody else, especially in the Canadian media, go to rebelun.com.